Good afternoon, and thanks so much for tuning in here to our New Testament Bible study with Shehalem Christian Fellowship. We're going to be picking up today in the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 6. So if you have your Bible with you, I just encourage you to turn there as we get started. So we do invite you to, to join us in person for our Sunday morning service where we, we open the scriptures together. We're in the New Testament in book of Acts, same study that we'll be doing this afternoon here. Uh, but we'd love to have you in person as we worship in song, as we take communion together, as we fellowship around God's word and uh, pray together. Always a wonderful time. Uh, the Lord faithful every Sunday to meet us as we gather together uh, to honor him, to worship him, to glorify him. So love to have you out there. We're going to be meeting this week at 14141 Northeast Cooney Road. Uh, <clears throat> again, 14141 Northeast Cooney Road. So love to have you out there. Uh, we also have our midweek Bible study. Wednesdays, uh, we air it uh, live here. Uh, for those who can't make it out in person, we air it at 4 p.m. On, on Wednesdays, but we meet in person at 6.30 p.m. out at West Shehalem Friends Church, currently studying the Old Testament together. We're in the book of Jeremiah. Just finished up Jeremiah chapter 10 this week. Moving on uh, to the rest uh, in the next week or so, we're going to be turning to Jeremiah 11 and so on. So we'd love to have you come out there and join us for that. But for today, Acts chapter 6. And as we do often, uh, every Sunday, taking communion together. So if you have, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have bread and juice that you have uh, available to you, we, you, can, you can join us as we do this uh, in remembrance of him. The scriptures tell us that as often as we eat and drink this cup and eat of this bread, the, the communion table, as often as we do this, we proclaim his death until he comes. And so we, we look, uh, as, our ha is a, as is our habit, we look to the scripture as we take communion together as a reminder of, because Christ is in all of the scripture. He's everywhere and uh, easy to see oftentimes in the New Testament, but you'd be surprised how when you're reading the scripture, you can get away from the pure, simple gospel as Paul warned us. So when we look at the scriptures, we can always find Jesus and a reminder of what he has done for us. So today, what I'd like to remind us of is here in verse 14, which we'll cover later in our study of Acts chapter 6. It says there, <clears throat> we have heard him say, now this is, we'll go into this in detail in our study, but this is a, a group of men who were accusing Stephen of blasphemy. And they say, we have heard this man, Stephen, say, that Jesus of Nazareth will, will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Interesting accusation. Likely referring to the when they say Jesus will destroy this place, likely referring to how Jesus said, if you kill this temple, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. Speaking of the, his death and his resurrection and how he will, re, he will come back to life through the resurrection. So they misinterpreted that. And they also misinterpreted this idea of destroying the customs that Moses had given them. You see, Jesus had no intention of destroying the customs. Well, maybe the man-made customs, but certainly not the law. We read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law and prophets, he said. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law for us. Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe, as Paul expounded on in Romans chapter 10. And he did this through his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. He has forgiven us our sins. If we receive him, the scripture says, he, he forgives us of all of our sin and he imputes to us his righteousness. So as we take of the bread, Lord, we thank you for breaking your body for us, Lord, that your body was broken. So we take this bread in remembrance of you. And likewise, Lord, we open the juice, the cup, and we remember your blood that was spilled for us, your blood given for the remission of sins, as you tell us. And we're so thankful for that, Lord. And we take this cup in remembrance of you. 
Amen. Jesus has fulfilled the law for us. And with that, we turn again to Acts chapter 6 to begin our study today. You know, in the book of Psalms, in Psalm chapter 119, I often like to draw a scripture out for us as we begin our study that reminds us of the perfect word of God and why we continue going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Bible. And often I find that it, it not only is a helpful way for us to remember, but it also springboards us into the topic that we're going to look at and, and uh, the scripture, what the scripture is teaching us. And today I want to point us to Psalm chapter 119, verse 135, Psalm 119, 135, where it says, make your face to shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. David's prayer. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach us your statutes. Psalm 119, verse 135. And you know, God is never shining upon us more than when we are hearing and living his word. His word, James tells us in the book of James in the New Testament, is like a mirror. And by that mirror, Paul tells us in Corinthians, we still only see dimly. We see through a glass, a mirror, dimly, but his face, it shines upon us as we look to him, his very word. We with unveiled face, the scripture tells us, we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And so we're being transformed. We're being transformed through the reading and hearing of his scripture as his face shines upon us. What other things might make our face shine? This is an unfamiliar uh, verbiage for us in our culture. We talk about how people are glowing or, or people have a, a shining face or, or something about them when they're doing something that they enjoy. For many in our culture, that might be something like sports. Now, it's not something I fully understand because sports doesn't always start my motor, so to speak, but I know it is for many. Soccer, I know, is very, very popular. It seems like I, I don't know a friend with kids that aren't in a soccer, uh, playing soccer at some level or doing something with soccer. For me, it's not something I totally understand because, man, all that running, no, it's, it's, it's tough. And I often joke that I would, I would want to be, a, if, if I was going to be playing soccer, I'd be the goalie. Now, that just reveals how much I don't know about soccer because last time I said that, I think I, I, think I was talking to, to Micah, Dimitri, and I use that term goalie, and they looked at me, it's not a goalie, it's a, it's a keeper, it's a goalkeeper. So that just shows you exactly how much I know. The problem with that is if I tried to be a goalie, I'm not really good at catching either, and I'm not really good at blocking, but that's okay, because I'm also not very good at jumping. So I guess, I guess goalkeeper probably wouldn't be for me. Ironically, though, even though I'm not that great at all those things, I did like basketball. When I was in middle school, I played on a basketball team. And uh, honestly, I really did enjoy that. And the, the coach, I remember, he used to always tell me that I was good at defense, which I think was his way of saying, maybe don't touch the ball. <laughs> just, just, just defend, you know, make sure other people can't pass it and other people can't shoot it. But I took that to heart. You know, I thought I'm pretty good at defense. I was also really good at passing the ball to other people so that they could shoot it, you know. And, uh, and, and this, this defense that I was good at, I remember my coach telling me that to, to hone in my skills, he, he really thought I was very good at rebounds great at rebounding. I was, I was just a little taller than a lot of the other kids, so I was always playing center or forward and uh, often stationed near the basket or underneath it. And uh, I'd come down with a rebound, you know, I'd get my elbows out and I'd start spinning around and just knocking all the other kids over like a good sportsman. And uh, I was pretty good at that and so good at that. I would get pretty excited about it because I thought, oh, I'm so good at this. And I remember one day uh, a play that was so good uh, in my mind, right? I came down with the rebound and I, I got everyone off of me and then I went right back up and got the, 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 the ball into the basket. And I thought, you know, I nailed it. Well, problem was I was on the wrong side of the court. I was rebounding on the other side of the court and I put up a basket for the other team. And so... Uh, that little memory plays in my mind still. Like late at night, I'll be laying there. Oh, why did I do that? No, I, I've obviously since moved on with my life. But, uh, you know, being told 
that I was so good at defense and being encouraged by that. I maybe maybe I let that get into my head just a little bit. I got a little bit overzealous. And you know, the same thing can happen to us as Christians. You know, Christianity is not a sport, right? Walking with the Lord is not a sport. Sometimes we say the word, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, and we say that because it's true. It's not something that, that we do quickly and then, and then turn away and we're done. It's a marathon in the sense that we'll be walking with the Lord all of our days. It's not something that's done quickly and that we move on to the other things. So there's some truth in that. But, you know, walking with the Lord, being a Christian, it's not a sport. It isn't a sport. It's not a hobby. It's life. It's life. And this can happen to us as Christians. We get eager to defend the gospel or maybe just eager to defend a lifestyle, an ethical moral, moral code that we that we cherish and we found to be helpful to us. And so we stick out our elbows and we flare and we knock people down and maybe even, I suggest, make a basket for the other team. Because we're not thinking through what we're defending and we're not doing it in a way that is biblical. Because the Bible does say, don't get me wrong, we should be prepared to defend. The scripture tells that us that. But we should ask, stop and ask ourselves what it is that we're defending and how the Bible tells us we should do it. And with that, I'd like to backdrop the, the study today with a scripture from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It says, Peter tells us, sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Always be prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. And yet, he says, do this with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Again, 1 Peter chapter 3 Verses 15 and 16, sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give us meekness, gentleness, Lord, that you'd give us kindness. Help us to discern, help us to discern when and how to defend you best. Because, Lord, we know that you don't need to be defended. Yet, the scripture tells us, Lord, to defend the hope, to be ready to defend when somebody asks us about the hope that is in us. So, Lord, increase our hope. Give us hope. Lord, give us hope by your Spirit so that others may, others may see and others may ask. In Jesus' name. Acts chapter 6. For context, we know the church has been growing. We just left off as the church was growing. And... With the growth of the church, complaints began to arise. And with those complaints, the apostles met them head on and they appointed seven men to serve and to help them so that they could focus on the word of God and prayer. And one of those men, his name was Stephen. And we're going to read all about Stephen today. In fact, we'll also read about him probably next week. And who knows, maybe in another week or two. I don't know. I know Micah will be preaching through uh, chapter 7 here. I'm not sure if he's going to try to get fit that all into one Sunday or not. It's a pretty big, uh, pretty big chapter, but we'll, we'll see Stephen here today and launching into a sermon that he'll give. He'll, he'll teach through the entire scripture in one chapter. It'll be a, a, a proved to be a wonderful time, so hope you join us for that. But Stephen here, we pick up in chapter 6, verse 8, as Stephen, it says, was full of faith and power. And he did great wonders and signs among the people. And then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Sicilia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, 
this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. So in verses 8 through 15, we see Stephen, full of faith and power, doing wonderful works. And then the synagogue of the freedmen, or some among them, and we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about who those people are. We see them disputing with Steve, Stephen, secretly inducing men to lie about him, to spread false witness, and they drag him before the council. And as the council looked at him steadfastly, they saw his face as an angel. Now we're going to camp out here in this text today while I attempt to hopefully draw out three points for you that I think are important to see from this text. The first one is that people will dispute. People will dispute. Stephen, as he served the church and as he went about doing great wonders and signs, he found himself in controversy with the Hellenistic Jews. Stephen, a man chosen to serve in practical ways, yet a man who, verse 8, says he was full of faith and full of power, full of faith. Now, I don't want to diminish the fact that the God-breathed scripture, that the Holy Spirit penned, commends Stephen as one who is full of faith. What a wonderful testimony, an amazing testimony. He was a man that was full of faith, but many of us have been discouraged at times by our own lack of faith. Even many ravenous wolves dressed up as sheep have told us that if we just had more faith, then when we prayed, we'd be healed, we'd be answered right away. We would have the, the wealth that we want. We would have the healing that we want. But it's not true. God would heal us, they say, if just we had more faith. And so, like the disciples, we might cry out at times, Lord, increase our faith. And Lord, we do ask that he would increase our faith. But when the disciples prayed that, do you remember Jesus' response? They said, Lord, we need more faith. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, he said, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. If we had faith even like a mustard seed, he said. So because faith itself, the fullness of our faith, the strength of our faith is not the important thing. What's important is the object of our faith. Who are we putting our faith in? Our faith, it floods in and it trickles out at times. There's days when our faith is strong. There's days when our faith is weak. Maybe you feel like I have more of those other days, those days when my faith is so weak, I'm not even, I'm not even sure if it's there. But with him, there is no variation or shadow of change. The object of our faith is what's important. The late Tim Keller, he was quoted as saying, strong faith in a weak branch is infinitely inferior than weak faith in a strong branch. Again, strong faith in a weak branch that's going to break, that's going to crumble under your weight is, in, is fatally inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. The important thing is the object of our faith. So Stephen, he was full of faith and verse 8 says he was full of power as well. God's power, the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the same power that we all have in us through him. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7, Paul wrote, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
And it's interesting to me that though the scripture tells us here that Stephen did great signs and wonders, none of those, none of the miracles that he performed are recorded except the power of his words, the power of his preaching, which we'll see in detail in chapter 7. A sermon that ends, and this is a bit of a spoiler alert, hopefully you already know this, the sermon that Stephen's about to preach is going to end with the execution of Stephen. You might say, I wish when I preached I could get applause, but for Stephen, he didn't get that. He didn't get a standing ovation. He didn't get oohs and ahs. He didn't even get compliments or, hey, good word, brother Stephen. No, no, he got stoned to death. He got murdered. He got executed. And to call it a sermon kind of actually takes away from the context a little bit of what it really was. It wasn't a sermon like we preach today in the 21st century. It wasn't, it wasn't a sermon in a church with your warm coffee in hand, with your Bibles on your lap. It wasn't that kind of a sermon. No, he was responding to the disputes. This was spontaneous. It wasn't prepared. It was a spontaneous re response through the Holy Spirit to the disputes that the men had brought against him. Because there were some, verse 9, there were some of the synagogue of the freedmen. And it lists the locations from which they came, which by looking at this, it's very, very likely that Saul, or who we'll know of as Paul later, was likely among this synagogue as it lists these places. And as we see in chapter 8, he was there consenting to Stephen's death. It's very likely Paul was a part of this. These were Hellenistic, Greek-speaking Jews, just like Stephen was, and just like those who we saw last week who had complained against the apostles because they felt like their widows were being neglected. It was the same. But calling them the synagogue of the freedmen implies that at some point, apparently, they had been enslaved in some way and been set free. But here they are, verse 9, disputing with Stephen. You know, there are disputes that we ourselves can stir up. There's disputes that stir us up. There are disputes that we get caught in the middle of. As the Proverbs say, he who passes by and meddles in a quarrel that's not his own is like a man who takes a dog by the ears. Just a little tip, don't do that. <laughs> if two dogs are fighting, I know this firsthand, I have a scar on my finger to prove it. Trying to get in the middle of two dogs fighting, not great, not wise. So there are certain types of disputes in this world. There are disputes that we must avoid, but there are disputes that are necessary. So may the Lord give us the wisdom to discern. As 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 and 25 tell us, avoid foolish, ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance. Gentleness, patient, humility, patience, and humility. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. So may we be rec able to recognize the difference. And no matter what dispute we get into, may we always, always be gentle, patient, and humble. May our words be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that we may know how we ought to answer each one. Because if you speak by the Spirit, if you speak by the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, kindness, and gentleness, You'll find verse 10, as these men were not able to resist. They were not able to resist. And it wasn't Stephen's infallible logic, or it wasn't his strong, convincing arguments. It wasn't his persuasive rhetoric or his big fancy words, his eloquence that they were, were not able to resist. What it says is, it was the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. The wisdom and spirit by which he spoke. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that it can be God, not us. The power, 
the excellence belongs to him. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. And furthermore, in verse 13, he says, Since we have the same spirit of faith, even the same spirit that, that Stephen had, according to what is written, and I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. But we speak not from ourselves, by our authority or our excellence. So, sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Recognize Christ as the wisdom of God, the power of God, the righteousness of God. Fill yourselves up with His light so that His light can shine in and through you, through faith. And always be ready, as Peter said, to give a defense to everyone who asks for the reason of the, for a reason, for the hope that is in you, for the hope, a worthwhile dispute. If you're going to dispute over something, if someone asks you about the hope that is in you, what a, what a glorious thing to share. But do it with meekness and fear. It says there in 1 Peter chapter 3, having a good conscience, having a good conscience. So the first observation here, people will dispute. Just as Stephen served and he worked miracles among the people, some disputed him. And though they disputed, they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. People will dispute. And number two, people will discredit. Not being able to resist his wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke, they resorted to manipulation and lies. You see it there in verse 11. They secretly induced men. They set up false tactic, or excuse me, false witnesses. This isn't a new tactic. This is something old, something that the devil has been doing for since the beginning. And we know, of course, the same was done to Jesus. They secretly induced men and they set up false witnesses who said, verse 11, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. It's interesting, it's telling really, that to blaspheme Moses in their eyes was on equal footing as blaspheming the Lord. Because they recognized, and rightfully so, that Moses' words, the words of the Old Testament, were God-breathed. It was Scripture. But they had also convoluted extra-biblical teachings about Moses and put them also on the same level, all the while ignoring plain and clear Scripture, because it was Moses. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, it was Moses who promised a prophet would come. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Him you shall hear, he says, according to all that you desired on the Lord, uh, of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see his great fire anymore, lest I die. Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God because there must need be a mediator between God and man. These people recognize that. They couldn't look on God. They were terrified of his voice and they said, we need, we, 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 we can't, we can't lay our eyes on him and rightfully so. So Moses promised there would be a prophet in most of your Bibles. You'll notice it's a capital P. There'll be a prophet that'll rise up among you. He'll be among you. He'll come from you and he'll be a prophet like me, he said, but much more, a greater than Moses as the book of Hebrews tells us. So while they said he was blaspheming, <clears throat> excuse me, turning back to Acts here, while they said he was blaspheming, they missed, they didn't even know that it was actually the words of Moses that were being fulfilled right in front of their eyes. And it says, verse 12, they stirred up the people. They stirred up the people. You know, it is easy to stir up people, especially to stir up people to do bad things. 
It's easy to stir up people for evil, but it's much more difficult and far more worthwhile to stir people up for good. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us in chapter 10 verses 25, 4 and 25, the author of Hebrews tells us that's why we come together. He says, let us consider one another in order to stir one another up for good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more so as you see the day approaching. It's why we come together or one of many reasons a good reason to stir one another up to good works, to love and to good works. But they stirred up the people against Stephen, 14, verse 14, saying that he was saying that, the, that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Satan specializes in twisting truth or questioning truth, just like in the garden. Has God really said? Did he really say that? And these people, they twist the truth because Jesus did speak of the temple of his own body being destroyed, as we talked about during communion. He spoke that way, and he said it would be rebuilt in three days. Perhaps something Stephen may have used in his arguments, in his reasoning, in his disputing about the resurrection, using Jesus' own words as these people refer to. He said, they say that, that Jesus would destroy the temple and change the customs. As for the customs, they were of God. Jesus, excuse me, as for the customs, whatever customs were of the Lord. Jesus wasn't coming to destroy them. He said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Romans chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, he says, Paul, speaking of the Israelites, he says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and, seek, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Oh, he wasn't coming to destroy the law. He was coming to fulfill it, to finish it, to finish it. So even though these people, these men that came against Stephen to dispute them, even to, to, to dispute him, even though they could not resist the spirit and the wisdom by which he spoke, they still, they still did not turn to the Lord. They continued to reject. They continued to refuse. Just as Paul said, they weren't willing to submit to the righteousness of God, but they sought to establish their own they didn't want the law taken away. They wanted to establish their own righteousness. They knew the truth, but they traded it in for a lie, and they so discredited Stephen. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that when they defame you, and they will, not if they defame you, when they defame you as evildoers, don't be surprised. Again, it's not if, but when. Just as they defamed and discredited Stephen here, and just as they did Christ, even though they could not res resist the truth, they did reject it and they did defame those by whom the truth would come. So even when they defame you as evildoers, Peter said, those who revile your good conduct in Christ might be ashamed. So we see here, people will dispute and people will discredit. Not being able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke, they resorted to manipulation and lies. Well, we continue on with number three. People will dispute People will discredit and people will discern. People will discern. Having manipulated the crowds, having spread 
fallacy among them. The people bring Stephen before the council, and it says, verse 15, looking steadfastly at him, they saw his face as the face of an angel. Looking steadfastly at him. You know, whether we like it or not, the world is looking steadfastly at us. The world is looking steadfastly at you. You know, there's times where throughout my career at, in, in the corporate world, people would recognize that I was a Christian and I hadn't actually said anything to them. There wasn't anything miraculous. Well, I shouldn't say it that way. Of course, there was probably miracles, the Lord doing works. But people just knew. I hadn't even told them. I hadn't said anything, but people would recognize something. I don't know. I don't, I don't think it was because my face was glowing like Stephen's. And I'm sure many of you have had these same experiences where someone starts talking to you and they immediately realize without any explanation that you're one of God's children. Somehow, it says, they look steadfastly at Stephen. They look steadfastly at you. You know why? Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill can't be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. So let your light shine. So, so let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we are lights and we are to be lights we are to be as as paul said in philippians chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 blameless harmless children of god without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world philippians chapter 2 verses 15 through 16 and he didn't finish it there he said as you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life, the same word we started our study with today, that, that David cried out to the Lord, Lord, let your face shine upon us and teach us your statutes. That's the, 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 the mirror that we look into where the glory of the Lord reflects upon us and we are transformed. We don't hold fast to our own words. We don't hold fast to our logic or our strength, but to his, trusting in him who shines his light through us. And so the people looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. Somehow, something about Stephen's face made it unmistakable that he was a messenger of the Lord. Paul spoke of our faces as well. I've already alluded to it. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he spoke of how Moses, when, when Moses was before the Lord, his face shone, and he spoke of how when those of Israel would read Moses, they read it with a veiled face, not understanding. But he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just, by, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. When Moses is read, when the Old Testament, when the Scriptures are unfolded, when we look into them with unveiled face, we are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image. And he continues in chapter 4, verse 7, saying, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, <clears throat> yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, as Stephen will be. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. For we who live always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so then death is working in us, but life in you. They saw his face 
as the face of an angel, the Lord shining through him, though he was cast down, though he was persecuted, perplexed, he wasn't forsaken, not destroyed, but Jesus' life manifested in him. Now, don't tell Micah, but I'm going to sneak into chapter 7 just a little bit. You'll see this will launch us into Stephen's sermon. The high priest said in verse 1, Are these things so? Are these accusations that have been brought against you, are they true? And Stephen answered, Brethren and fathers. Brethren and fathers. I find this amazing. He didn't answer, Look, you doofuses, <laughs> you idiots, you morons. He didn't use def- De, de, he didn't use derogatory or defi- he didn't answer evil with evil but he said brethren fathers he used respect he maintained respect in the face of fierce opposition this verse that i've been quoting from 1 peter chapter 3 where it says to be always ready for to, to always ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. It says in in the New King James, which I'm reading from, it says with meekness and fear. In the ESV, it's translated as with gentleness and respect. With gentleness and respect. With meekness and fear. If you are tearing down your opponents with derogatory terms or language, shame on you. Shame on us. If we think that sharing demeaning memes online or or using bumper stickers that are derogatory towards another group, if we think that those things are harmless, we are sorely, sorely mistaken. Heading into election season, words are going to get worse and worse heated and more heated, stronger and stronger. And it's tempting to dive into that world. But I encourage you, dear church, don't. Don't go there. Continue to speak with gentleness and respect. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus raised the bar. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, he said, Whoever says to his brother, Raka, that is, empty-headed, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, Or, as the Greek puts it, you idiot, you blockhead, you moron. Whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. That's a very high bar. The language that we use at the water cooler or on social media, the the language that you hear on your favorite podcast, or when you put the dial on to something on on the AM side and you hear the pundits talking and the language that they're using, some of it ought to make us blush before a holy God. The tongue, James said, is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless God our Father and with it, we curse men. We say so much worse things than just raka and fool. But even those what we would think of as light insults, according to Jesus, would would make us accountable to the fire of hell. So James went on and he said, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. These things ought not to be so. So sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, gentleness and respect, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, and they will, those who revile your good conduct in Christ might be ashamed because they discern, ashamed because they know that as the gentleness and meekness and power of Christ is manifest in you, they are, excuse me, they are not fighting against persons. They are not fighting against you. They are fighting against the Lord. So the people will dispute. 
the people will discredit and the people will discern. They saw something otherworldly, supernatural in Stephen, something that had that that they recognized was like the face of an angel who had filled himself, Stephen, had filled himself with God's word, speaking by a wisdom and a spirit that they could not resist. If God is for us, who can be against us? So as we end our time, let's read a little from 1 Peter and we'll be done. He continues on after chapter 3, this scripture that we've been quoting, the scripture we've been, been reminded of in 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter continues on and he says in verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 4, he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. On their part, he is blasphemed. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. For the time has come. It says, for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Peter says here, when we partake, when we partake of the sufferings of Christ, we're blessed, he says. Blessed are you, for the Spirit of God rests upon you, just as it did upon Stephen. So, Lord, make your face shine upon us. Make your face to shine upon us. Teach us your statutes. Give us meekness. Give us gentleness. Give us fear. Help us to speak well, Lord, when we're challenged, when we're disputed. Help us not to be those who stir up disputes. Your word tells us to avoid quarreling and to be gentle. But Lord, we know disputes will come. We know people will defame. People will say bad things. But Lord, help us to respond appropriately. Help us to give good reason for the hope that's in us. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for our New Testament study here in the book of Acts. And we do invite you to join us on Sunday morning as well. We're going to be meeting this week at 14141 Northeast Cooney Road. Love to have you Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Until then, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you peace. God bless you.